I gripped the steering wheel with sweaty hands and stared straight ahead as a person dressed in full riot gear stepped up next to my truck, holding a huge gun. I didn't know what to do, other than sit there frozen. I'm going to need to see your driver's license, sir. Please don't get smart and try anything, or I will shoot you in the head. I lifted one hand from the steering wheel. There, on the seat next to me, I said. My wallet. Okay? The man nodded his helmet. We don't have all day now, he said. Go ahead and get it. I fumbled around with one hand until I finally had it. I handed it over and he had a look. He kept looking up at me, and then back down at the license. Then he spoke into a radio clip to his shoulder. 759 reporting in. I have located the gardener. Repeat, I have located the gardener. Confirm that assistance is on route. What? A strange robotic voice replied, This is confirmation that assistance is on route, 759. What is this? I asked the man. What's happening? We're saving the world, sir, he said, handing the license back. You'll understand soon enough. Please, do not worry. Everything's going to be okay. Somehow, I wasn't reassured. Within a minute, three more riot gear troopers or whatever were marching toward my truck. Then they were all at the driver's side door. Please step out of your vehicle and come peacefully with us, said a woman. We have been cleared to take a non-violent approach with you, sir. You are very fortunate. What about my girlfriend? I asked. And our cats? They're in the car behind me. The woman turned her head and took a quick glance at Lauren. I could still hear the cats through the open window, hissing and yowling. If she's on the list, said the woman, then she will be joining you shortly. No, I said. If we're not together, then I'm not going anywhere. So you better check your list now. The woman nodded to the man who had originally come up to my truck. Check her out, 759, she said. Then she turned back to me. We have been authorized to use a non-violent approach with you, but commanded to bring you with us by whatever means necessary. I watched in the rearview mirror as this 759 dude looked over Lauren's ID. He spoke into his radio again, and then walked back over. We have been authorized to bring the gardener and the gatherer together, he said to the rest of them. The what? And the cats? I asked. Back to the radio. This is 759. The gardener has requested to bring along two felines. They are currently secured in crates in the back of the gatherer's vehicle. Permission granted or denied? I held my breath until I could hear that robotic voice cut through the silence. Granted. I would have felt a great relief, except I wasn't sure if that just meant that we were all getting dragged off together to die in the woods. I guess that was better than dying alone, at least, if we were going to die anyway. I stepped out of my truck and walked, with two big and heavily armed escorts, over to Lauren's car. She got out, and our captors, or whatever they were, let us hug. Are you okay? Lauren asked. Sure, I said, genuinely smiling because I was with her again. Having a completely normal one. We will carry the felines, said 759. I don't know, man, said Lauren. They are not keen on strangers. 759 opened the back door and took out the two carriers. I thought that by then I'd heard it all from those two, but what now issued forth from those carriers was a sound as though ten witches were screaming at being burned alive. I thought that my ears were going to start bleeding. He handed the carriers off to two of his buddies and then shouted, above the wild sounds of the cats, follow us please. I looked at Lauren and wondered if we'd soon be dead. I could tell that she was thinking the same thing, and that the answer was, probably. We walked in a procession, with 759 leading the way, me right behind him, then a riot gear, then Lauren, and finally two riot gears, each holding a cat carrier. From somewhere far behind us, I heard a gunshot. I winced and looked up, where the last of the massive metal roof tiles were being dropped into place. There was only a small square of open sky left. We walked silently through a short stretch of woods until we came to a group of people huddled together in a corner where one metal wall met another. There was another wall surrounding these people, though not one of metal, it was a wall of riot gears, pointing their guns straight into the crowd. You two will go stand with the rest, said 759. No matter what, do not move. If you move, you will die. We would strongly prefer that you didn't. The cats? Asked Lauren. Can I have them? Shortly, said 759. If you do as you're told. We went and stood where the others were crouched. 
The area smelled like sweat and piss and shit. People were sobbing and muttering in fear. One woman stood up and made a break for it. She put her head down and started running. I expected the guards to shoot her, but they didn't. We tried to save her, said 759, but we sadly can't save everyone. She's dead now. You'll see. And then I did see. I heard the rumble first, coming from above. I looked up and at half a second to process what a coincidence it was that we were standing under the one square of the roof that wasn't filled in yet. This was followed by another half a second in which it dawned on me that the roof was actually falling down, intact, as one giant sheet of massively heavy metal. It did not take long for it to reach the ground. I stood there holding Lauren, looking around in shock. The roof was now the floor, and had crushed everything, except for those of us who were below that one empty space. In an instant, it had crushed all of the trees, and all of those cars, with the people still in them. Everything. The woman who had run away. They were all dead now. Hundreds of people, flattened to death in the blink of an eye. All of the survivors were silent. The only noises were our two cats, Hanky and Hattie, who had somehow become even more wild. They were clawing at the sides of their carriers. And then the thunder from overhead. I looked up at the now completely open sky, and saw the darkest and thickest clouds I have ever seen. Bolts of lightning were shooting constantly from the darkness in every direction. We're in hell, I thought. Wah! What is happening? I asked Lauren. I think the sky just fell, she said. A bolt of lightning crashed down several feet in front of us. The brightness made me instinctively close my eyes, and I felt an incredible heat. When I dared to open them again, I saw that the spot where the lightning had struck was glowing green. It got brighter and brighter, and then. It's hard to describe. It's like that spot of the floor was suddenly sucked away into nothingness, and in its place was a vast, seemingly endless black hole. Everybody now please step into the portal, said 759. Nobody moved. We were all looking around in shock. Everything is quite fine, said 759. The travel will not harm you. 766, would you please demonstrate? One of the guards nodded, and then walked over to the black hole. She turned around, and stepped into it backwards, like she was climbing down a ladder. I watched in disbelief as her leg was swallowed up by the darkness. Soon, she was gone altogether. What happens if we don't? Somebody asked from behind me. Then we will shoot you, said 759, very matter-of-factly. You all have been selected for this journey, and it's our objective to see you safely through to the other side. But if you refuse, then you no longer serve a purpose, and our actions will reflect that reality. People started stirring. Those who had been crouching stood up slowly. But nobody was making any movement toward the hole. I squeezed Lauren's hand and then spoke up. I'll go first. 759 nodded. Excellent. A born leader. That's very good news. Then he spoke into his radio. The gardener is incoming. I turned to Lauren. You come right behind me, okay, baby? I don't think we have a choice. I love you. I love you, said Lauren, obviously fighting back tears. I broke away and walked toward the hole. There was just endless darkness there. I bent down and put a finger inside. It didn't feel like anything at all. I pulled my finger out and did like the guard did. I turned backwards and started climbing down the hole. It was very strange, as though the hole itself were very dense, so even though I couldn't feel anything solid under my feet, I could control my movements, and I didn't fall quickly into the darkness like I had feared. I stopped while my head was still in this world, and took one last look at Lauren. My god she was beautiful. Then I ducked down and I was on the other side. It was a short drop to the ground, which I wasn't prepared for. After moving through that dense hole, the resistance was suddenly gone, and I panicked as I fell. But it was only a couple of feet, and I recovered quickly. I still have not yet recovered from the strangeness of the world that I landed in. All around me, the ground was made of black rocks. I could occasionally see shocks of red scattered among the rocks, I later found out that these are some kind of plants. Above, the sky was covered in those same dark clouds that I had seen before, bolts of lightning shot out continuously from them. In the distance, I saw what looked like a single mountain, standing tall. Other than that, the landscape was completely barren. It was mostly those rocks as far as my eye could see. It instilled a sense of hopelessness right away that to a large degree hasn't left me since the moment I've arrived here. There was a greeting party waiting for me. More of those people in their riot gear. Welcome gardener, 
said one. We've been waiting for you. I saw Lauren's shoes starting to emerge from the black hole, which was floating about 10 feet above the ground. What is this place? I asked. Why are you bringing us here? Why are you calling me the gardener? The professor will explain everything, said one of the guards. Oh, right, of course. And here I was worried about things. And who is the professor? I asked. Lauren was in up to her waist now. You'll meet him soon enough, said a different guard. He pointed off to the massive mountain. There. Great. I walked over and got ready to catch Lauren. I didn't want to grab her legs yet and freak her out. Finally, she emerged fully, and dropped into my arms. Hi, I said. Not exactly the honeymoon we talked about, but I guess it'll have to do. Off in the distance, we heard something shriek. As soon as everyone was through the hole, including Hanky and Hattie, we set off together for the mountain. At first we worried about our cats, but it turns out that there was no need. They are strangely calm here, and have been walking along with us, outside of their carriers. And they're not alone. I mean, there are other cats here. We will be walking along, and a cat will pass us by from the other direction, just nonchalantly swinging its tail. It's a very bizarre sight in this environment. But the cats and the red plants aren't the only things living here. We found that out on the first day. We were maybe halfway to the mountain when somebody in our group shouted out, a snake. They're in the rocks. I looked down and for a moment it really did look like a snake. Until it arose. I saw it in a flash, but I'll never forget it, especially because I've seen many more since. Its body was skinny and scaly like a snake, but it had appendages. Its arms were black bones, as if taken from a human skeleton and then scorched in hellfire. They were the same color as the rocks, which made them blend in when the monster slithered around on the ground to sneak up on us. At the end of those bone arms were long and sharp claws. These now tore into the person who had cried out, slicing her up into a pulpy mess in an instant. I didn't see the head that time, because there really isn't a head. It's more like, where the head should be is just this undulating gas, like when pavement gets really hot. It's like there's something there that you can't quite see. The monster picked up the dead woman and scampered off with her, as our guards fired off dozens of rounds. It was no good. The thing got far enough away and disappeared with the corpse, even though there was nothing to disappear behind. They travel in the ground, crawling through the rocks, and somehow managed to drag their victims down there too. You have to hit them in the heart, said 759. The good news is that they have three of them. We started with 43 people in our group, not counting the guards. We're down to 20. Not all of the dead have been claimed by monsters. Some have simply dropped from exhaustion. The mountain is steep, and there is not much that we can do to help them. We're given periods of rest. But not long. Instead of water, they give us something that seems to keep us going. It tastes very bitter, almost like drinking straight lime juice, but more metallic. After we drink it we don't need to eat, or hydrate, or sleep. I have seen a few lucky people doze off for a bit, but most of us are on full alert all of the time. It took a full day for us to reach the foot of the mountain, which is somehow just more black rocks piled on top of each other, and we've been climbing for three days now. There is never any change in the sky, no sun, no moon, just dark clouds, constantly spitting out bolts of electricity. The only way that I can mark the passage of time is by looking at my phone, which somehow has full battery life despite being on the verge of dying before we stepped into the hole. I have checked my mysteriously charged phone a million times for reception. Most of the time, there is none. In fact, most of the time, there is only a string of numbers running across the screen. But sometimes, I do get reception. I've been able to listen to 27 voicemails from worried friends and family, but haven't been able to make any calls. Sometimes, I can access certain websites. I don't know why, but I've found that the internet works in a limited way when one of our cats is curled up on my lap, nudging the phone with his or her chin. There is some kind of deal with cats and the hellscape that we find ourselves in now. I wish I could tell you more. I wish I knew more. For now, we're getting ready to march again. Up the mountain to see the professor. It feels like we've been doing this for years, but I know it's only been a few days. We only have a few minutes of rest period left, and I want to spend some time with Lauren. So I'm just going to try to send this out. I hope it gets to you. Your encouragement last time has really played a big part in keeping me going. A part of me wants to grab Lauren and the cats and just start running. But there's nowhere to go. It feels hopeless, but reading your messages has been a beacon in an otherwise utterly dark world. I will try to keep you updated.